Так, всім доброго дня. Я радий вітати державного секретаря в Києві. Дякую за те, що він проводить два дні в Києві. Spending these two very intense days in Kyiv for his time with the Ukrainian officials, very detailed meetings with the leadership of this country, including president, prime minister. We started our negotiations with the state secretary yesterday and we continue today. We've discussed all of the matters that or issues that matter. But first of all, I would like to thank Tony for standing with Ukraine, for having stood with Ukraine since the very beginning of the all-out war. Uh, we met at uh, the Ukrainian-Polish border, at the border uh, crossing point, and since then, the State Secretary has provided every possible support to Ukraine. Of course, today that uh, we've uh, discussed almost all of the issues on our agenda, we focused on Kharkiv and Donetsk Oblasts, the most challenging and ta taxing uh, areas of our front line. And Tony's visit today is a signal of uh, support to our defenders. The USA um, is standing by, the assistance is coming, and it will make our resilience and our standing up to the enemy uh, more effective and uh, stronger. This terror can be stopped only with force, with determination and agility of the entire coalition of our partners, chaired, of course, by the United States of America. And today, the message and the key issue that we've discussed together concerned not only the scope of uh, the military assistance, including equipment and ammunition to be delivered to, uh, to Ukraine, but also about the speed of this delivery. Uh, speed now is a key factor. The armaments, uh, the equipment, and the ammunition should be coming as swiftly as possible to prevent aggressive plans of Ukraine against Ukraine, against the rest of Europe and the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, I am extremely thankful to the State Secretary for uh, his untiring efforts to speed up the delivery of uh, the military assistance to Ukraine. A separate topic of our discussion was the development of the military industrial base of Ukraine, and we also uh, focused on investment in the um, industrial um, military industrial base that will make Ukraine stronger and more independent when it comes to defense. I would also like to thank the USA for allocating additional funding for the congressional uh, decision for adopting this package of assistance and another topic that uh, also takes a lot of our attention and time is uh, the delivery to Ukraine of additional Patriot systems. We looked at the in entire you know, inventory that can be as accessible, that can be brought to Ukraine, and the State Secretary is working with each of the respective countries, again, uh, putting in a lot of effort, and we appreciate that. You will remember that we urgently need seven batteries, of which two batteries are necessary, and they were necessary yesterday, so that we could protect the city of Kharkiv and the entire region of Kharkiv. This is uh, the uh, focus of our attention and efforts. We have to make life of Kharkiv citizens uh, safer, and we have to protect our positions against this offensive by the Russian troops. And we understand that there are available systems, and we are working together to make their delivery um, 
the speediest possible and the uh, the most effective. I'm glad that we are approaching uh, to the achievement of this goal, but we should speed up this effort. We also discussed sanctions against the Russian Federation and the topic of the practical use of frozen Russian assets. And we here see eye to eye on uh, the fact that uh, the recovery of Ukraine should be funded by the aggressor. Russia should pay for uh, the uh, destruction and ruination that it has caused. And the US um, is also taking a lead in the G7. And I asked uh, the State Secretary to continue pushing so that other members of G7 could uh, go as far as the US in what concerns the confiscation, the seizing of uh, frozen assets. You know, there can be no a meeting between the foreign ministers of uh, the USA and uh, Ukraine that would not focus on um, Ukraine's potential membership of uh, NATO. Two very intense, very busy days. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for uh, them. This is a very powerful message to both our friends and our enemies. Thank you. Over to you. Well, Dimitro, thank you very much. And, you know, I remember very well standing with you just inside uh, Ukraine next to the Polish border. And I think back to that. I think about the road that's been traveled since then. Um, if you count that, I've been here five times since the Russian reinvasion, four times to Kyiv. Uh, yesterday I had a chance to speak about the work that we're doing, the steps the United States is taking to help ensure Ukraine's strategic success. Um, we're working to ensure that Ukraine can deliver on the battlefield today as it continues to protect the country from Russian aggression, but also put itself in a position where it can deter and defend against future attacks and fundamentally secure for the Ukrainian people the right to decide their own future. Uh, we have, of course, the supplemental and the assistance from the supplemental is on its way. In fact, some of it's already been delivered. Uh, but today I want to add to that by announcing that we will provide an additional $2 billion in foreign military financing for Ukraine. And we put this together in a first of its kind uh, defense enterprise fund. And it has three components. Uh, one is to provide weapons today. Uh, so this will assist Ukraine in acquiring those weapons. Two is to focus as well on something that Dimitro just talked about, investing in Ukraine's defense industrial base, uh, helping to strengthen even more its capacity to produce what it needs for itself, but also uh, to produce for others. And finally, using this fund to help Ukraine purchase military equipment from other countries, not just the United States, uh, for Ukraine's use. All of this, in particular, uh, as we're thinking about the defense industrial base, builds on an incredible spirit of innovation, of ingenuity, of entrepreneurship that we, hear see, we see here in Ukraine, and that I, again, had a chance to, uh, to witness for myself. I saw it at the um, Bravel facility, uh, which is doing extraordinary work, innovative work with entrepreneurial vision. Um, I saw it uh, in the uh, extraordinary work uh, as well at the company producing uh, world-leading uh, prosthetics. Uh, and uh, we saw it in the way that Ukraine has adapted uh, to deal with the Russian onslaught against its agricultural enterprise, uh, but the work that it's done to find ways around that and to continue to be uh, a leading exporter of food and a breadbasket for the world. Of course, everyone's eyes are focused on the situation in the east and the northeast, and Kharkiv in particular. Um, and so the newest support that I just announced, but particularly the $60 billion supplemental, we know is coming at a critical time. Um, Ukraine is facing this renewed, brutal Russian onslaught. Uh, and we see, uh, again, senseless strikes at uh, civilians, residential buildings. Uh, I emphasize to the President, uh, in my conversations with um, the Foreign Minister, uh, the substance of uh, the, the, the work that we're doing to get the, uh, the aid to Ukraine. We're rushing ammunition, armored vehicles, missiles, air defenses, rushing them to get to the front lines, to protect soldiers, to protect civilians. 
And on air defenses, as Dimitro said, this is, of course, a top priority. And we focused in our own conversations uh, in detail on the work that we're doing to find more air defenses and to get them to Ukraine. And I can tell you that that, for us, is a matter both of urgency and priority. Uh, another major issue that uh, we talked about is the bilateral security agreement between Ukraine and the United States. Uh, and as you know, there are now 32 countries that have negotiated or will soon complete negotiations on these bilateral security agreements, agreements that will sustain assistance to Ukraine uh, for the next decade and enable it to build this future force uh, that can deter aggression and, and defend against it. We've done very good productive work between our teams on this. Um, we're going to finalize the, uh, the text, I think, very, very shortly. But the heavy lifting has been done, uh, and we're, we're there, and I imagine we'll be able to sign that agreement in a matter of weeks. Um, and as I said, uh, many other countries are doing the same thing. Uh, I think this demonstrates to Ukraine, but also to Putin, that many countries will be supporting Ukraine for a long time uh, to make sure that, again, it can deter aggression and, as necessary, defend against it. As important, as well, is the economic progress that uh, Ukraine is making. As I said, I saw firsthand some of the initiatives that have enabled it to uh, continue to succeed economically, even under the most incredibly difficult circumstances. The fact that, as a result of the, the Black Sea, and as a result of pushing the uh, Russian Navy out of the way, exports through the Black Sea are pretty much equal to what they were before the Russian regression, that speaks volumes. The fact that Ukraine has found ways, with uh, help from uh, many of us, to find other export routes, whether it's Danube, whether it's uh, across land, all of these things are helping uh, Ukraine to maximize uh, its exports. And I mentioned the extraordinary innovation we've seen in so many of its other enterprises. Finally, uh, let me say that maybe the best word to describe Ukraine and Ukrainians in this moment is resilience. It's uh, been truly extraordinary. The constant um, examples of bravery, determination, courage, um, resilience are here in every corner of society. Uh, and it's also a commitment on the part of Ukrainians, as I said, to write their own future, even as they're dealing with a very difficult present. Uh, and we see that, of course, from the soldiers, we see that from so many citizens. We see it from a dynamic civil society, uh, which is one of the things that's at the heart of Ukrainian democracy. Uh, and here, pushing for the reforms necessary for Ukraine's eventual entry into the European Union, uh, to NATO, that remains critical. Bottom line is this. Uh, for anyone who's tempted to bet against Ukraine, don't. It would be a big mistake. We've heard the same thing sometimes about the United States. Never a good, uh, good bet to bet against us. Never a good bet to bet against Ukraine. Uh, we've been through challenging times together. Uh, I have every confidence that together we will get through these difficult moments and together help build a country that is free, that's prosperous, that's secure, that writes its own future. Thank you, Excellency. We have a short time for a few brief questions. Let's start with Washington Post. Michael. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, Secretary Blinken, um, uh, the Biden administration has uh, made clear it doesn't want Ukraine using uh, U.S. equipment to strike onto Russian territory. Uh, the situation in Kharkiv, right on the border, um, uh, is, is pretty dramatic right now. And uh, it seems like your, uh, your restrictions are making it very hard for Ukraine to respond to the Russian attacks, since a lot of them are coming from Russian territory. Does that ban make sense right now? Um, and are you considering relaxing it? Um, and um, you know, President Zelensky asked you yesterday for uh, two Patriot batteries for Kharkiv. Uh, what do you say to that? What are your plans? Um, last, uh, is there a chance of Ukraine negotiating an end to this war before the end of this year? And do you think that's something that would be desirable? And um, Mr. Kuleba, uh, how much of what you're seeing now on the front lines, the situation there is caused by the delay in U.S. aid to Ukraine. And um, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, yesterday, and perhaps today, spent a lot of time uh, talking about corruption in Ukraine. 
um, and pushing uh, you to do more about it. Um, do you agree with him that corruption remains a major problem uh, in, in this country? And how much should Americans be worried about corruption when they are sending Ukraine aid? Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. So first, let me be very clear about one thing, which actually shouldn't require clarity, which is that the United States is committed uh, to helping ensure Ukraine uh, winning this war. And I think we've shown that through the extraordinary support that we've provided and that we continue to provide. Uh, we have not uh, encouraged or enabled uh, strikes uh, outside of Ukraine, uh, but ultimately Ukraine has to make decisions for itself about how it's going to conduct this war. A war is conducting in defense of its freedom, of its sovereignty of its territorial integrity. And we will continue to back Ukraine with the equipment that it needs to succeed, that it needs to win. On the Patriot batteries, um, as I mentioned, we are intensely focused on Patriots and other forms of air defense um, and making sure that we can find them, bring them to Ukraine. Um, Kharkiv, of course, is one urgent priority. There are others. All I can tell you is this is something we discussed in detail and that we're actively and urgently uh, working on. Uh, finally, in terms of negotiations, uh, these, again, are decisions for Ukraine to make, uh, not the United States or not uh, any other country. Uh, so if um, I imagine that if Putin showed any interest in um, seriously engaging uh, in negotiations, uh, I'm sure Ukrainians would respond to that. But what Putin is demonstrating every single day is exactly the opposite. Uh, but fundamentally, these are questions for Ukraine to answer. We've been very clear. Uh, we support Ukraine. We support Ukraine in its uh, decisions. And uh, there will not be, uh, never will be anything about Ukraine without Ukraine. Um, every delay of supply results in setbacks on the front line. This is the general rule. So the answer to your question is yes. Uh, we appreciate the sincere commitment of the United States to compensate deliveries, uh, delays in deliveries with new announcements and new deliveries. And this is why I so much emphasized the issue of timing in both our talks and uh, in, my, in my opening remarks. But it doesn't apply only to the United States. I mean, every country, we encourage every country to make new, new announcements and to deliver on them. Because in the end, we have seen it hundreds of times. When a Ukrainian infantryman or artilleryman has everything that he or she needs, we are winning. Every time there are delays in supplies and insufficient supplies, we are not winning. The law of the war is cruel, but very clear. It allows us to know what and how needs to be done. On your second question, there is a perception of the level of corruption, and there are facts about the level of corruption. And uh, when I read reports and uh, assessments produced by the most uh, prudent watchdogs on, corruptions, on corruption, like the European Union, or the International Monetary Fund, we see that they commend Ukraine for taking anti-corruption measures, for introducing anti-corruption reforms. And there is always a very simple criteria. You know, if we were as corrupt as the perception says, they simply wouldn't be giving us any money. They wouldn't be opening uh, accession talks with uh, Ukraine to exceed the European Union. And the United States wouldn't have uh, trust uh, in Ukraine. So there are issues which we are addressing together. But uh, I think it will be true to say that since his first day in office, President Zelensky, and uh, since the first sessions of the U Ukrainian government and parliament, we've been consistently tackling issues of corruption and achieved serious results on this track. Mr. 
I have a good question to the State Secretary, if I may. You said that the USA would not uh, either ban or encourage the use of American armaments um, uh, for uh, hitting the Russian territory. Uh, recently, David Cameron said that uh, the UK would not object to using the uh, UK armament to hit uh, the territory of um, uh, the Russian Federation. When will you be ready to uh, follow suit? Thank you. Um, again, we're uh, determined that uh, Ukraine win this war and succeed for its people uh, and for its future. Uh, we've, uh, we've been clear about uh, our own uh, policy, but again, uh, these are decisions that Ukraine has to make, uh, Ukraine will make for itself, and we're committed to making sure that Ukraine has the equipment it needs to succeed on the battlefield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tom Bateman from uh, the BBC. Mr. Secretary, um, President Putin has announced he's uh, going to visit China this week. We were with you three weeks ago in Beijing where you warned of consequences if China didn't stop its exports to Russia of tools and parts that make weapons used here in Ukraine. Um, have you been able to tell your Ukrainian counterpart that you are now imposing those consequences or have the Chinese listened to your warning? And if I could ask you about Gaza, um, Israel has taken control of the Palestinian side of the Rafa crossing in the last week. That means that the last territorial connection to the outside world for ordinary Palestinians in Gaza is now occupied by Israeli forces, which has the potential um, to create a very serious crisis with Egypt, and there have been quite a few warnings about this. How long can Israel stay in control of that crossing? And where is the line and where a limited operation in Rafa turns into something that you've said you oppose? And we've seen nearly half a million people now displaced from Rafa over the last week or so. Um, and Mr. Foreign Minister, if I may, um, we heard from the uh, Secretary of State yesterday that the US is with you for the long term on this. But I just want to ask the question that there is a US presidential election later this year. It may be a promise for the Secretary of State to make, but not necessarily one for him to keep. And are you concerned about uh, what that may mean um, for the long-term support for Ukraine? Thank you. Tom, thank you. Um, first, with regard to, to China, and uh, you, heard, uh, you heard me talk about this at some length when, uh, when I was in Beijing and uh, since then, as well as other colleagues in the government. The concern that we have uh, is this. Uh, it's not about China providing weapons to Russia for use in Ukraine. North Korea is doing that, Iran's doing that, others may be. Uh, China's held back from that. But what we are deeply concerned about is the support that China is providing to Russia to rebuild um, its defense industrial base in ways that are materially contributing to and making uh, a difference in its aggression against Ukraine. As I said, uh, when we were in Beijing, we see that um, the overwhelming majority of machine tools that Russia is getting from abroad are coming from China. The overwhelming majority of microelectronics that Russia is getting from abroad uh, are coming from China. And these are going directly to strengthening that defense industrial base that over the last year has been able, uh, as a result, to churn out more tanks, more armored vehicles, uh, more missiles, all used in the aggression against Ukraine. So what uh, I shared with uh, Chinese counterparts, and I've said uh, here as well, is that um, not only are we looking and watching this very carefully, but as necessary, we, ha uh, we have and we will continue to take action, including sanctioning uh, entities involved, uh, companies involved. We've already uh, levied something like uh, uh, more than 100 sanctions um, against uh, enterprises that are involved in this kind of support. Uh, and as necessary, we're going to continue to, uh, to do that. Now, the other thing that's important about this, uh, as I said then, and I think you're seeing this, this play out too, is that to the extent China is looking to have stronger relations with countries in Europe, uh, it can't on the one hand seek to do that, while on the other hand uh, remain responsible for fueling uh, the biggest threat to Europe's security since the end of the Cold War, because the threat posed by Russia 
is both the immediate threat um, here uh, in Ukraine as a result of the aggression, but also as it works to try to get around sanctions, export controls, et cetera, uh, in rebuilding its def defense industrial base, uh, an ongoing and potentially growing threat to many other countries in Europe. So this is of acute importance to many Europeans that I've talked to, and I imagine that they're making that known to, to Beijing as well. With regard to Gaza, one of the deep concerns that we have uh, is the impact of this limited operation that we've seen to date in Rafa on the ability to provide humanitarian assistance because the two main points of access in the south, uh, Rafa itself and Karem Shalom, have been affected by the, um, uh, by the, the, the resulting conflict uh, in, uh, in the south. Uh, and we've seen at the very time when Israel was taking important and much needed steps to improve the provision of humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in Gaza, we've seen a, a negative impact uh, on uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, this uh, act, very active conflict in the, in the Rafah area. Uh, we also see Hamas firing at the, the crossings themselves, um, making it also more difficult. So in and of itself, we have this urgent problem of restoring the full operational capacity uh, of Rafa and of Karem Shalom to make sure that assistance gets in. Now, we're also seeing uh, real progress in the north where more is coming through, but what we don't want to see um, is a situation where we've basically reversed what's happened in recent months where assistance was working its way through in the south, but very little was getting to the north, to have that reversed and have improvements in the north that are much needed and need, and need to continue. Um, but then to see um, steps backward uh, in the south. More broadly, we've been very clear that um, when it comes to the future of Gaza, uh, we do not support and will not support an Israeli reoccupation. We also, of course, do not support uh, Hamas governance in Gaza. We know and have seen where that's led all too many times for the people of Gaza and, uh, and for Israel. Uh, and we also can't have anarchy uh, and a vacuum that's likely to be filled by chaos. That only underscores the imperative of having a clear, concrete plan for the day after the conflict in Gaza in terms of governance, in terms of security, in terms of rebuilding uh, Gaza for, uh, for its people. Uh, and uh, here, it would be important for Israel to focus on that as well. We have been doing a lot of work on this, as I mentioned the other day, uh, with um, partners in the Arab world and beyond over several months. But it's imperative that Israel also do this work and focus on uh, what the future can and must be because, again, it cannot and says it does not want responsibility for Gaza. We cannot have Hamas controlling Gaza. We can't have chaos and anarchy in Gaza. So there needs to be a clear, concrete plan and we look to Israel to come forward with its ideas. Well, first, uh, Secretary Blinken always keeps his word. And I know that if he cannot promise something, it doesn't mean that he's not working on it. He just gives his promises when he is confident that, uh, that, he, can, that he can deliver. And I sincerely appreciate it. Um, Secretary mentioned the security agreement that Ukraine and the United States, our two leaders, presidents, will sign. And this is the document that will be signed not on behalf of the State Department or the Biden administration. This is the document that will be signed on behalf of the United States of America. And it will cover a long range of, wide range of security cooperation issues. And the United States will undertake certain commitments under this document. And we all know there is a very fundamental rule in diplomacy. It sounds in Latin, pacta servanta sunt. Agreements must be implemented. Um, so this will be the promise that no future administration, irrespective of the outcome of this, or any other any future elections in the United States will be able to ignore until uh, 
this uh, agreement will be in force. Good afternoon, uh, esteemed uh, State Secretary, Minister, sir. We know that in mid-June there will be the uh, the um, peace summit. It will focus on Ukrainian uh, peace formula. We'll see representatives of the USA and at what level. And the minister has mentioned that uh, the uh, security agreement will be signed by the leaders of the countries. Uh, does it mean that very soon the two presidents are going to meet? Um, and are there any plans on uh, President Biden's uh, part to visit Ukraine? Uh, with regard to the peace summit, we strongly support it. Uh, we want to make sure that it's a success, uh, and uh, we will be robustly represented there. I don't have any announcements to make uh, on that, except to say we're working on it uh, to make sure that um, we support this very important initiative and, and uh, that it uh, produces real results. Uh, and with regard to the two presidents meeting, I fully anticipate that they'll have the opportunity uh, to do that in the weeks ahead, as uh, Dimitro said. Um, among other things, uh, we want to sign the bilateral security agreement that we're on the verge of concluding. Oh, for uh, understandable reasons, uh, we do not disclose information on the uh, dates of uh, visits or contacts uh, or comings to Ukraine or goings from Ukraine, but uh, Presidents Biden and Zelensky have got very trustful relations uh, through dialogue, and I'm sure that they will be able to talk in detail about all of the things in the agreement.